you please welcome Ireland's living legend, the king of country music from Castleblady in County Monaghan. Would you say hello please to Big Tom and the Bell Honours. If you love some agitable and you're tired of all those tears you don't have to keep thinking all the time Well, I'm in that old boat at you that's been sinking for so long If it's lonesome at your table, you're welcome here at mine Here we are backstage at the London Irish Festival 2008 in the heart of Roundwood Park and we're kind of crushed between two caravans but it's in order to make sure that we have a relatively quiet place because Philomena Begley is doing her musical thing out on stage. Ginger, Hello there. everybody knows that uh, the story of the... You were the lead singer of the Mainliners and the Starters and <laughs> you were the pop singer and this was the swinging 60s it was. and then there was Gentle Mother. But yes. You actually wrote the song that was the first ever mainliner. On the B singer. side. On the B side. I did. In the late sixties, you see, there was nobody writing songs, only Bob Dylan and the Beatles. So all of a sudden I took to copying all these kids and I wrote a song. And John McCormick, the manager, nearly flipped. We didn't think anybody could do this. So we recorded the song and he he wanted to put Gentle Mother on the back of it. He loved the song. So then we recorded it, and out of the record we got the showband show along with Joe Donan. God be good to be gone now. And uh, when the showband show was over, um, the letters came in to John McCormick, and even to some of the radio stations, which wasn't too many at that time, looking for Gentle Mother. Instead of? And I faded into history. But what was the other thing? Well, what was the song that faded into history? I'm thinking of you. Me and it faded away, and the other thing is history. But well, I'm thinking say. of you, you still sing in your sleep, oh, do no. you? <laughs> I do not. <laughs> but I, do, I, I must do it again. Yeah. What inspires you? I, I often... I don't really know, probably. I don't really know. It's, it wasn't a bad song. But the other thing was to happen, and it did happen. And aren't you glad Thank God. Did? I wouldn't be here today. Went to a picture show last Sunday don't you know little Susie met me there I knew right there by the smile on her face No other girl would ever take a place Come on little Susie be my girl Come on little Susie be my girl Henry Arthur McMahon is probably as legendary as Big Tom and the Mainliners at this stage. So, uh, a London Irish Festival just wouldn't be the same without a Mainliners gig. Um, Henry, everybody knows the story of the of the Mainliners, but let's let's just talk about when it actually started. Am I right in saying that you actually were working in a local petrol station? Yeah. yeah. So, how did it get from there to here? Well, how long do we have? But basically. Uh, when I was working at the uh, film station, a, a man called and he said he wanted to book uh, a band for a dinner dance in the Riverdale Hotel in Bally Bay. Uh, and we had, I think it was a five piece at the time, uh, and uh, we had £12 for the gig. And we went, played it, and the man who was there and his wife that night, uh, John McCormick, uh, God rest his soul, uh, John. Uh, uh, come up afterwards and said he liked the band and that he owned the Maple Ballroom in Rockhurry and he was wondering uh, would we play a date for him you know. So then uh, the next thing we had five then we had six we had Searle and John Beatty. So after after Bally Bay, after Bally Bay uh, it became bigger and bigger and here's the thing I want to ask you because everybody knows about Big Top of the Main Island story. Yeah. Uh, but you, if I'm right in saying, would probably have been the business head in the band and, along with John. So, what was John McCormick like? John McCormick w was a lovely man and a gentleman, and not only that, worked extremely hard. 
he had a friend in Dublin who uh, knew somebody in RTE that got us the spot on the showman show. And on the, at first showman show, Big Tom sang Gentle Mother. And, and that was that and was that it. Was it. That was it. Yeah, exactly. But the great thing about it is here we are, same seven days, forty three years later. A long way to continue. Thanks, Henry. She looked down into my brows And I said, say a prayer for me She threw her arms around me Saying, God will keep us free and You could hear the rioters come I said, this is my last fight Well, if they take me back to Texas They won't take me back alive uh, I got interested in, in, in drumming as such uh, when my mother was playing accordion at home in the, in the kitchen and I was using two knives playing on a copper pipe and I wasn't sure what I was doing but uh, it seemed to be working for me alright and from then on uh, drumming seemed to be what, what I was interested in you know. But, uh, I was working in a rice factory and Seamus McMahon was there and Ginger was there at the time and we obviously moved from that and then I uh, we got involved then with an early mainliners and I picked up from there. I think Ginger was drumming at one stage in the band and he decided to pick up bass guitar and these drums were available. Again, I didn't know what they were, but when I got in behind them, away I went. <laughs> so it, it moved from that. Then I started to go to the, the embassy ballroom that time. Uh, it was uh, it's a, new, a new hall, and the, all the bands started them in, the show bands. And one of the first bands that I, I kind of picked up, I thought they were a great band, was the Johnny Flynn band uh, from Chew. And there was a drummer in that band, Frankie Hannon very simple way of playing but he seemed to be the backbone of the band and a great singer as well uh, I, I enjoyed that band but then there was other bands came in at that time all the bands were touring and of course the Royal Show Band was was one of the top bands and again uh, Charlie Matthews was the drummer in that band and as it turned out I was doing a style of playing that Charlie was doing and it actually turned out to be a great style and Charlie absolutely was the king. So I'm second best. <laughs> when the battle stopped and the smoke cleared, there was thunder from the throne. The seven Spanish angels that took another. Sir, when did you realise things were getting serious? Ah, oh, I don't think I ever realised it. <laughs> it was happening, I didn't even know what people was to say and this, that, another. So you're still having the crack 43 years later? Oh, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, like, I mean, we, we never thought it would have come to end like this, Pascal. In the early days, we just thought, crowd of country lads having a bit of crack, being in local football clubs, things like that. Then all of a sudden, people were saying, God, you are fantastic. You sir. Oh, the crowds was outside there. We said no. They were telling us they broke the doors to get in and all this sort of stuff. We thought they were having our legs, you know. We thought it was all bluffing. Do you still get the buzz, Cyril? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Even more so maybe now than ever, you know, because you see so many people, you know, that you've met years ago and that you maybe thought had passed on. And people thought I had passed on. There was a guy rang me one day about 10 years ago. I don't know where he got my number. I was aware of the band for a few years at the time and he says, uh, is that Cyril? I said, yeah. I said, yeah. Oh, Jesus, yes, I'm delighted. I heard you had gone over the other side, he says. Hey, thanks, no one.
Everybody knows about Big Tom out front being the singer. However, behind him, there is this very unique mainliner sound. And one half of that sound is standing right here in living flesh. Seamus McMahon, how did it happen? How, yes, did it happen or was it, uh, was it created? It, well, I suppose it was created like, uh, from playing the type of thing that I would do. I wasn't depending on playing sort of heavy rhythm because John Beatty was doing a lot of that with the keyboards. And uh, what I was doing actually would have blended in along with John. I suppose you could say it was a combination of, of the both blending in together. And uh, again, you needed something to, uh, that would sort of stand out from the, not clash with the keyboards as such. And, uh, but do you have guitar players down through the years coming yes. up to you and saying, Seamus, how do you do it? Yeah, you would have different people would be impressed. <laughs> well, I suppose I tell them that it's something that it's, it would have been, I suppose, simple enough for me to do it that way. Like, but I suppose when you get into the nitty gritty of it, it I suppose it is difficult enough. Like, but to work at that and get your own sound, I suppose it's a combination too of how you set your amp and what sort of a tone you use on the guitar. Well, listen, don't tell them too much. They'll, they'll be copying it. <laughs> can't, can't copy the mainliner sound. Not allowed. Bar I, I think we're on. I think so. I was talking to one half of the sound. Now, you're the other half of the sound. How did the sound happen? I don't know. That's, now, that is an honest answer. Yeah, because I've been trying to figure out. Yeah, I don't was know. it inspiration or was it just no, one it night just, you woke up in bed and said, this is it? No, no, it just happened. You know, and we, you know, we can develop between Seamus and myself and we can't do it separately. Another legend, another definite legend. And the only last question is this, the, the actual sound itself. You know some people, that recording engineer said that that was kind of a mistake. Music, and that it was the way that you did the reverb or whatever. But I think you were much more cleverer than that. I don't think there was any cleverness. It, I can only do it the only, you know, I can only do it the one way, my way. You know, and I can only use my own keyboards and I can't use anyone else's keyboards and a, you, all you, those sort of okay, things. Okay, I tell you, you wouldn't feel like singing a little bit of, no, I did it well, they never, my yeah. way. But one thing they never asked me to sing in the mainliners. Oh, oh, there's a story there. I thought that I'd get married and try to settle down. But I left her standing there in her wedding gown. Saw her smile and invitation to come in. That's when the wheels fell off the wagon again. Break out the bottle, ring on the cheer. Miss a bartender, I'll have another beer. Tomorrow I'll be hurting when that awful thirst begins. The wheels fell off the wagon, and I'm getting wild again. Yeah, the wheels fell off the wagon and I'm getting wild again. Now, now we have him. I tell you, it's very difficult to get this fellow to sit in the one place. In fact, he's got very used to travelling around. I heard you've had a wonderful experience arriving here at the London Irish Festival. Oh, you wouldn't yes. care to tell us about it. I gather you walked half the way. We went to uh, we went to Belfast and and we were in Belfast uh, an hour or so when we discovered that uh, the flight was cancelled that we were travelling on. Oh, they knew you were coming. <laughs> but the the so the, you went to the say that then they would they'd put the flight back maybe to two o'clock and. Uh, then they decided that, that flight wasn't going either, and uh, they said there was another flight about half seven in the evening, and, and this was at 11 o'clock in the morning, you know. So uh, they wouldn't guarantee that that flight would go either. So uh, we uh, we looked around, and, and uh, the best we could do was uh, we got seats on a plane going to Liverpool. So. Uh, anything was better than That's sitting where we were, and, and as so you thought at the time. Yeah. What has you found out later? Maybe you'd be as well off stay where you were. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, we probably would have been here just as fast if we had a wait. The but whole you day, but you that know. wasn't the end of the story. 
No, we, we flew to Liverpool and then we got a bus from there to the Lame Street Station and, and uh, we got on a train and uh, the train was going to bring, bring us to Luton but uh, then they decided we all changed at Sheffield. So we changed at Sheffield and we got on another train at Sheffield and uh, we were up the lane about a couple of miles and they decided then this train, uh, this train is not working too good. So uh, they said we were going to change you all at the next stop. This is the toughest run I ever had. <laughs> so we, we, we all changed the vet onto a, a different train at the next stop and uh, proceeded on then to uh, on to Luton. Any but truth in the rumour you were singing smoke along the track at that stage? <laughs> no, but Henry was sitting in a corner taking down notes of, of different things that's happening and uh, by the time we got to Luton, he had the most of a, a, a song written about this uh, this journey. It was you know. a warm summer's evening <laughs> and a train bound for London. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to be in Luton. We're just on our way now down to London here. We hope to have a good day tomorrow anyway. So apart from those lowlights, 43 years on, do you still enjoy this? Uh, I tell you what, Pascal, uh, we all got back together there a few tours ago. The whole band got back together, and, and uh, you could see it in every one of the lads in the band that what we were doing, they were enjoying it. You know, because the sound, the old sound, was still there, and, and the buzz, and, and uh, it was mighty. There's no doubt about it. We have enjoyed every bit of it. You know, in the last lot of tours that, that we were back, you know. Something I want to ask you, because I asked Henry, your memories of John McCormick, because people, you know, sometimes forget that yeah. he was as much part of Top of the Mainlanders as anybody. Well, John was there from the start, and, and uh, he was a great manager, and worked very hard, he worked very hard for us. And uh, way back at the beginning, uh, before we had a wagon or anything, uh, John was a bread man, you see. We, we, we had a gig on, uh, I'm not sure where it was, it was some distance away anyway, and we had no we had no proper van for carrying the gear, and John uh, took the, the bread out of the bread van and uh, the shelves or whatever, and put the gear in the bread van, and we arrived at the gig in, in, in the bread van. And, uh, I think he decided after that that uh, maybe we needed a wagon. That's our form of transport. <laughs> I'm sure if he was there yesterday, he wouldn't have been. He'd have sorted out the Belfast Liverpool one anyway. I can tell you. Uh, well, he would have been. He would have been on the phone to be, to be years born on somewhere. Finally, yeah. the people we haven't talked about, but who have been a constant in your life, all of your lives, are the fans. And I the know, fans yeah. are going to be listening to this. What can yeah. you say about them, Tom? Uh, I don't know, look, uh, maybe uh, in country music, I think, Pass, you, you make fans. Like we made, made fans way back in 1966, 1967 and 8, and, and uh, I can still see them there today, you know. Like, that's loyalty, and, and you can't, there's no substitution for, for the way that uh, the people are really loyal like that. And, and, and I, think it's, uh, I think it's more so in country music that. Uh, you make a fan in country music and they stay with you down through the years and that, you know, and in pop music it's a different thing. The, the folly, you know, one man this month and whoever's top of the charts next month to follow him and that, you know, but country music, once you make a fan, they stay with you and they're very loyal and that. And you haven't been bothered by all the tugging and pulling and dragging, I even saw it here today from people. Ah, no, <laughs> not at all, no. No, so it's, uh, it's great. Like uh, if they weren't doing that, you you wouldn't be you wouldn't be uh, you wouldn't be travelling and you wouldn't be doing these sort of things. You know. And I know that stage. many of them are going to be looking at you and saying, "Aren't you looking great?" So how is the health? <laughs> the health, well, so the health's not too bad. You know, after all uh, the wear and tear down through the years and that. You know, I, I uh, I'm still buzzing and getting up in the morning and so doing a bit. Forty-three years old, right? Another forty-three. <laughs> Shh, we're not going to tell you about that, but he'll be here. He'll be here. Living legend. Another one.
Town and the Mariners. Put that in your paper and smoke. <laughs>